If you have a patient with hypotension, then you are definitely going to be using vasopressors. And there are a variety that you can use. But today, we're going to talk about the best vasopressor, the creme de la creme, the one, the only, nor epinephrine. And for international listeners, nor adrenaline. Now, before I tell you why noradrenaline or norepinephrine is the best vasopressor, I want to give you a little bit of background into what it actually does. The precursor to norepinephrine is dopamine, and dopamine is broken down into norepinephrine. And just a little medical trivia for you, norepinephrine can be further broken down into epinephrine. And hopefully these are familiar chemicals that you've heard about before. But what norepinephrine does is it works on a variety of receptors. It works on the alpha receptor. An alpha receptor, as you recall, is a direct vasoconstrictor. Constrict. It works on the arterial system and also works on the venous system. More on that in just a bit. It also works on beta 1 to increase contractility and beta 2, which is a smooth muscle relaxer or vasodilator. So how does all of this make norepinephrine the best vasopressor? Well, imagine if you will, you have a heart and the left ventricle is very sick. It's not pumping very well. If you were to just increase alpha when you have hypotension, this is going to increase the work that that LV has to push against to push blood out into this increased resistance system. But because norepinephrine has some beta as well, it's going to increase the contractility here at the same pace while also increasing the afterload here. And so the workload on the heart is not as bad as if you just use a direct alpha agonist. And this is why people refer to this as a balanced vasopressor. And to people call this an inopressor. The point here is it's not a pure vasoconstrictor and it's also not a pure inotrope. It's a balance of both and that's what makes this so good. But wait, it doesn't just stop there. Let's talk about the physiologic effects of norepinephrine, which by the way, you and me and everybody has within us. We talked about the afterload effect, the most recognized effect of this vasopressor. We talked about the increased contractility, makes it a balanced vasopressor. But here's the magic and what few people know. Norepinephrine causes venoconstriction. Now you might be saying, who cares about the venous system being contracted? Here's what happens inside our body. Think about your whole intravascular space as being this bucket of water. So you have 100% intravascular volume. Well, did you know that only 25% of that intravascular volume is participating in the circulatory system? This is what we call our stressed volume. That means 75% of the intravascular volume is in unstressed volume, and that is just hanging around in storage in venous capacitance vessels around the body. And when you become hypovolemic or you need more blood volume, what happens is that you venoconstrict and you bring some some of this unstressed volume into the stress volume to participate in circulation, to increase stroke volume, and to increase cardiac output. So if you have a patient who's sick and they need more intravascular volume, it'd be really smart if you could figure out a way to get the unstressed volume back in the game. And that's what norepinephrine does. By increasing venoconstriction, it brings some of the unstressed volume back into the stressed volume. And that, my friends, is one of the biggest reasons that norepinephrine is such a good vasopressor when you have critically ill patients. Now, some of you might be listening to this and say, wait a minute, isn't levofed what they call leave them dead? And people used to say this about norepinephrine because people weren't doing good resuscitation for their patients. They weren't giving good volumes. They weren't giving early antibiotics. And what would happen is that you would crank up the levofed just to keep patients alive because there was nothing else to do. People would have end organ injury. They'd have mesenteric ischemia. They've had necrotic fingers. They have coronary ischemia. And then that's where this term leave them dead came from. But now that we're doing good resuscitation and we have a much better handle on the physiologic situation than we did years ago, I don't think we should be calling leave them dead. I think we should be using norepinephrine as use it instead, instead of large amounts of crystalloid and instead of the other vasopressors that are out there. So remember, it's not leave them dead. I like the term use it instead. Now, I'll go so far as to say is you can use this vasopressor in almost every type of shock. Now, it's true. If you have somebody who's in hypovolemic shock, you need to give them back volume. If they're bleeding, they need blood. But in the interim, while you're waiting for that blood to arrive, a low dose of norepinephrine might be suitable for the venoconstrictive effect rather than giving that person tons and tons of crystalloid, which has its own inherent problem. For obstructive shock, PE, tension pneumothorax, tamponade, the fix for all these ailments is to fix the underlying cause. But while you're waiting to fix 
these problems using norepinephrine can be very helpful, especially for pulmonary embolism right here, where it can increase the cardiac contractility and increase the afterload. For cardiogenic shock, many people say you need to use inotropes, and that is true, but if you don't increase the coronary perfusion to the sick heart, you won't be able to use inotropy to increase the work from the heart. So using norepinephrine will increase coronary perfusion to feed those sick ventricles better blood flow, and then you can add your inotropy after that. And finally, distributive shock. The only type of distributive shock where norepinephrine is not your first choice would be anaphylaxis. A topic for another crit bits, but for anaphylaxis, what you want to give that person is epinephrine. For everything else, you're going to use norepinephrine, especially for septic shock. Because with septic shock, what happens is you have diffuse vasodilation everywhere in the arteries and in the veins. And because you have arterial vasodilation, the alpha effects of norepinephrine will help you. And also because you have venous dilation and pooling of blood in the untressed volume, even more untressed volume than you normally have, using the venoconstrictive properties of norepinephrine will help that person to venoconstrict and bring blood back into the circulation. In fact, there are many sepsis experts out there who truly believe that giving patients exogenous crystalloids is harmful to patients, and what we really should be doing is causing more venoconstriction, bring some of the unstressed volume back into stress volume, and that's the way to take care of a septic person while we're waiting for those antibiotics and the inflammatory response to come down. So that's my love for norepinephrine. It's good because it's balanced. It's good because you can use it in a variety of shock. But my favorite feature of norepinephrine is that it causes veno constriction and allows me to utilize blood that's just pooling around in patients that's not being used and bring it back into the central circulation. Now, the very last thing is the dosing of norepinephrine, and there's two general classes of dosing. You'll hear weight-based dosing and standard microgram per minute dosing. It really depends on your institution, but when you're using weight-based dosing, it's going to be 0.05 to 0.5 mics per kilogram per minute. And if you're doing just the standard dosing, you can go up to 30 to 40 micrograms per minute. Now, technically, there's no max dosing. But realize, once you go over these doses, now what you're doing is you're causing vaso and venoconstriction that could compromise blood flow to critical organs like the kidneys, the heart, the brain. And these would be some injury that you're causing because your vasoconstriction is too much. So just keep that in mind. On the next few crippets, we'll continue our discussion on vasopressors and ionotropes so that you know how to use all of these together. And folks, if you enjoy this video, please like and subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you on another Crippets.